Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let you and I begin with prayer. Almighty God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit into our hearts that he may rule and direct us according to your holy will. Comfort us in all our temptations and affliction. Defend us from all error and lead us into all truth. As we contemplate your social, your, your gospel message, may we grow in faith, increase in love and good works, and by your grace obtain everlasting life. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear children of our Lord and Savior, let us bow our heads and prepare for worship and the contemplation of God's word by a confession of our sins. Heavenly Father, it is with great humbleness that we approach your throne and majesty. We know that we are unworthy before you, for we, by nature, are sinful in thought, word, and deed. We confess our numerous sins, that we have failed to do what you command, and that we have continued to do what you forbid. But we know your love for us in our Savior Jesus. You sent him to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. For his name's sake, we confess our deep sorrow for disobedience and appeal to your grace and mercy for your forgiveness. It is in and through your love that we can confess, and it is because of your tender care and compassion that we humble ourselves and seek your forgiveness, your gift of redemption, and the faith to know that in Jesus, salvation is ours. Dear friends, Please know the mercy and grace of God. Know how he has sent his son to be our redeemer, to purchase and win for us forgiveness, and with that forgiveness, the precious promise of eternal life and salvation. We hear the urgent plea of Jesus on the cross, words for all of us, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And because of his victory from the grave, we also hear the words Jesus spoke to the paralytic as belonging to us, your sins have been forgiven. Go then in the peace of Jesus, knowing that by grace, through faith, you are counted as reconciled before the Lord our God. Peace be with you. Amen. Let's join together again in prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word that we may abide in your Father's house forevermore. We pray this, pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you then to turn your attention to the Word of our God, our scripture lessons for this, the fourth Sunday of Resurrection, Resurrection 4. Our first lesson is a historical lesson. It's found recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Then chapter 7, verse 2a, and then verses 51 through 60 of chapter 7. A note, we're kind of looking at the history of Stephen, the first martyr. In those days, as the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint arose from the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebrew-speaking Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called together the whole group of disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God in order to wait on table. Brothers, carefully select from among you seven men with good reputations who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will put them in charge of this service. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the entire group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Also, a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Some men who were from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. 
Stephen said, gentlemen, brothers and fathers, listen. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You are doing just what your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who were prophesied the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You who received the law as transmitted by angels, but did not keep it. When they heard these things, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they screamed at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one purpose in mind. They threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After he said this, he fell asleep. Here ends our first lesson. Let's then turn our attention to our psalm lesson for today. Our psalm lesson is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here ends our psalm lesson. And then let's turn our attention to our epistle lesson. Our epistle lesson for this day of worship is found recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 25, a reminder of our faith. For this is favorable if a person endures sorrows while suffering unjustly because he is conscious of God. For what credit is it to you if you receive a beating for sinning and patiently endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is favorable with God. Indeed, you were called to do this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He did not commit a sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself carried our sins in his body on the tree so that we would be dead to sins and alive to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you are now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Alleluia. And here now, the words of our gospel lesson. Our gospel is found recorded for us in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Do note, this text will serve as the basis for our sermon. Amen, amen, I tell you. Anyone who, enter, or anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own sheep, he walks ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration in speaking to the people, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, Amen, amen, I tell you. I am the door for the sheep. 
All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thus far, the gospel lesson. Let you and I now join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text before us this morning is found recorded for us in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, 7 and 9. Amen, amen, I tell you. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. Amen, amen, I tell you. I am the door for the sheep. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Here ends our text. Let you and I continue in prayer. O oh, gracious and wonderful Father, what a joy it is to once again be able to gather, to hear a message of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to hear how you, dear Lord, have sent a Savior of sin just for us. What a marvel it is, dear Lord, to sit down and to contemplate Jesus as the door. May he be our door. Amen. So I checked. So far in my life, I've preached on this particular text at least four different times. Now, I, I, I didn't go back and I didn't check the sermons, but in truth, I just, I just don't remember ever being struck by this idea of a door. Jesus calling himself the door. It, it, it just made my mind real. I, I couldn't get this off my mind for a couple of days. Now, now, in honesty, what mostly brought this about is the new translation, the Evangelical Heritage Version that we are using. You see, the NIV didn't use the word door in this particular passage, but they used the word gate. I am the gate. Anyone who does not enter by the gate, and, and so forth. Now, now, the Greek word is one that basically means an opening through which someone enters or exits. And then you then translate basically according to to the, the context. So a uh, sheep pen, on a sheep pen, you would maybe translate that as a gate, and on your house, you would translate that as a door. Perhaps the word door just strikes me as more fascinating because I perceive that a door is bigger and stronger and more secure than just a gate. So when I read our passage for today, that idea of the door, just, it just struck me. So think of all the doors we have in our lives. There are house doors and garage doors and car doors and elevator doors. There are big doors and little ones and thick ones and thin ones. There are solid wood doors and steel doors and glass doors and perhaps the flimsiest of all screen doors. Doors can be welcoming when they are open to us and doors can be threatening when they're slammed on us. Doors can keep us out or let us in. Doors can keep us in or let us out. Doors can be things of beauty or things that actually intimidate us. 
And should I mention that most doors are quite easy to see, but there can be secret doors that are hard to find. On a whole other plane, we speak of doors to our heart or doors to our mind or how the doors of wisdom can be opened. Did I cover it all? Wait, that, that's right. There was one famous band called The Doors. Seriously, I read this passage and I couldn't stop thinking about doors. But what I really enjoyed most was sitting down and thinking about how all these doors, with the exception of one, that's the rock band, could be used to contemplate and think about Jesus because he is the door. He is the epitome of all doors and what they represent. I am the door, said Jesus. And I like what it all means. So let's you and I just use this idea as the basis for our theme and see what we can learn. Jesus is the door. So let's just start with that simple premise and contemplate exactly what Jesus means when he says he is the door. What is interesting is that as you grasp the point of Jesus saying he is the door, then the whole of this text comes alive and it speaks deeply to our souls. The simple premise is that a door is an opening through which you can come in or go out. And isn't that exactly what Jesus clearly states in his words? Verse 9, I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. So without, without a doubt, Jesus is making sure that we grasp his importance his central standing in all that he teaches and in all that he is. These words make it clear. You do not enter or exit without Jesus. You do not have what Jesus is offering without him. What is Jesus offering? Eternal life and salvation. He clearly taught that he is the way, the truth, the light, and the life. He has explicitly shared that to know him is to know the Father who sent him. He openly declared that his coming is about the kingdom of God. It's about the salvation of souls and the fulfillment of all that God had said and revealed in his word. Jesus is that word. To reject Jesus is to close the door. To reject his word is to reject the Father and all that the Father is and reveals. And dig a little more. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world by their disobedience. God the Father had promised a Savior from sin who would be God himself. This Savior would come, and this Savior would be the one sacrifice that would atone for the whole world of sin. Sin was and is the problem that needs to be addressed. Sin needed to be paid for, for such is the fact, since God is holy and just. Enter then Jesus, the solution the Father gives. It is clear the coming of Jesus is about dealing with sin. Thus, Jesus is the door. Jesus became the door, the opening to heaven in two ways. First, Jesus lives the perfect life we could not. He obeyed perfectly the law of God with all its ordinances that dictate what our lives are to be in deeds and in words and, yes, even in our thoughts. Jesus faced every temptation and yet remained without sin for one purpose, that he might serve as the atoning sacrifice for all of sin. That is the second way. Jesus paid for sin as the perfect son of God. That is what Jesus did. That's the whole point of the cross and his suffering. That's what is behind his cry of agony and his declaration of abandonment by God. All of this so that once all was fully completed, Jesus could utter those words so important for us to hear, it is finished. The work of salvation was done. Sin had been utterly paid for, and God's righteous justice had been completely met in the redemptive love of Jesus. Jesus died eternally for us. Jesus paid for our sins before his righteous Father, Jesus became the door, the door that opens the realm of heaven and eternal life. Now, dear people, we are in the season of Easter. No, 
It's not about bunnies and candy and flowers and Easter eggs and new life. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus. That this Jesus who died was raised from death back to life, actual physical life, and the fact that this Jesus now lives eternally as our mediating priest. This idea of the mediating priest is exactly the role of Jesus as the door. You get in through him or you will be kept out by him. It's all an issue of faith. Yes, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus lets you in and out. You leave the sheep pen in order to go to the pasture. The pasture is where you are fed and watered and taken care of by your shepherd. The pasture is where you trust and where your trust and faith in the shepherd is absolute and you know he is giving you only the best pasture and the quietest waters for your good and life. But I also want you to pause for a moment and think of all the sheep who were in that pasture and then all the sheep that work hard to not follow the shepherd, who work hard to hide from the shepherd, even who work hard to run away from the shepherd. All of this and more is what's being spoken of as Jesus calls himself the door. But let's back up for a moment and speak of that very first section of our verses for today. Look at verses 1 through 6. Amen, amen, I tell you. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own sheep, he walks ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration in speaking to the people, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Now, a little bit of background is needed here. In the previous chapter, Jesus had healed the man who had been blind from birth. This blind man had been hauled before the religious authorities and relentlessly questioned about what had happened and who did it, even though they knew it was Jesus, and they were upset because the miracle had been done on a Sabbath day. They questioned the man, and they questioned his parents, and they were total scoundrels in trying to deny the various obvious fact that Jesus is special and Jesus is unique, and most likely Jesus is a prophet of God at the very least. But they hate Jesus. And they end up throwing this man out of the synagogue for just saying what Jesus did. Now at the end of chapter 9, Jesus finds this man and Jesus leads him to faith. This man, this once blind man, now believes Jesus to be the Son of God. And right then and there, he kneels down and he worships Jesus. A few of the Pharisees are there, along with Jesus' disciples and a crowd of people. The whole dialogue actually starts for us in John chapter 9, verse 39, when Jesus says this. For judgment I came into this world, in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Now, the religious leadership, they just scowl at Jesus, and then Jesus turns and he addresses everyone else. He addresses his disciples and the crowds. That's the basis and that's the context of our words for today. Jesus is telling them that he is our everything. He is warning them about false teachers and the destruction that they bring. But note how verse 6 ends. But they did not understand what he was telling them. It's then that Jesus continues to speak and teach the people. He will end up telling them that he is the door that he is the good shepherd, and that he and the Father are one. Now, if you don't understand any of this, I feel bad for you, because it's this section that shows the absolute importance of Jesus to our souls and to our lives. Now, if you would, I would like to mention that this section shows the only two reactions that you can have toward Jesus. You can be like the once blind man who kneels down and worships Jesus, or you can be like the people who scowled and grit their teeth and who tried to stone and arrest Jesus, 
In other words, the reactions of people who do not believe. Verses 1 to 6 about, are about those who are true teachers and those who are false teachers. True teachers are sent and given by the door. True teachers stick to God's word and what it says. They don't have to bend it or twist it. They don't have to excuse it or ignore it. They teach it as God's word and God's truth for the salvation of soul. Notice the false teachers enter by other ways than the door. That means that false teachers don't teach Jesus and his redemptive work. False teachers don't believe the Bible to be God's word. They don't believe the Bible true and inerrant in everything it says. False teachers are there for their own good and their own enrichment. Jesus says they are thieves and robbers. And then he says, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That seems pretty cut and dry to me. The shepherd you have is either speaking with the voice and authority of Jesus, which is the word of God, or he is not. And if he's not, why are you following? The shepherd, the pastor of your church in this case, is one who is to be a, a person who speaks of the wonder and marvel of Jesus. Seriously, are you hearing about what Jesus has done for you? Are you hearing how Jesus paid for your sins and was raised up again to show that his payment was complete and true? Are you hearing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the door of salvation? Or are you hearing how Jesus just came to show you a better way? Is your church about what Jesus has done for you, or is your church about what you can now do because of Jesus? And do you know the difference? When I say, do you hear what Jesus has done for you in your church, I'm asking if the message you hear is about Jesus as the Savior from sin. How he lived perfectly for you. How he died and was raised to life. And how Jesus now lives and rules over all things for our eternal good. The message is that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus grants eternal life and salvation. Jesus gives forgiveness because he has paid your debt before his Father. Jesus is God. And then Jesus, with his Father, sends the Holy Spirit to call you to faith and give you the gift of eternal life with him. The emphasis is on Jesus and his gift of forgiveness. Everything else follows and flows from this. Your shepherd speaks to you of Jesus. You hear Jesus' voice. You follow Jesus' way because your shepherd has behind him the real shepherd, Jesus, and his word. Are you hearing a message of Jesus in you? A message about Jesus? Because of Jesus, you can do this or that. Because of Jesus, you can love and be joyful and happy. Jesus shows you how to live your life to the fullest and, and then to be fulfilled. Jesus shows you how to obey and how to give to the Father because that's what Jesus did. Often the preaching, the preaching is about being this or that, accomplishing this or that, showing just how much you love Jesus and how you diligently do indeed follow and obey Jesus. I heard a great example of this the other day as I was on social media. Media, I was listening, uh, I was scrolling through Facebook actually, and, and somebody had posted a, a so-called modern Christian song. And although the song alluded to the greatness and goodness of God, that song was really about how the author followed and how the author of that song put their life into the work of being faithful to God. If you paid attention to the song, it was interesting because the song was more about the Christian than it was about the Christ. I think the key verses here are verses 9 and 10. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
life, abundant life, namely eternal life and salvation is the message of Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Enter through Jesus. Go to pastor through Jesus. He is our strength, our hope, our confidence, and our life. He is our door now and eternally. He is the door to heaven. He is the door to all that God grants and all that God gives. He is the only door. Let that sink in. Jesus doesn't say, I am one of the doors. He says, I am the door. In Jesus is our salvation and hope. In Jesus is our forgiveness and eternal life. In Jesus we are led by his word, his clear, plain, and simple word for our eternal good and salvation. Jesus is our door. Please, knock on that door and let Jesus open the wonders of eternal life to you. Amen. Having heard the word of our God, I now invite you to join together with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, what an absolute joy and wonder it is to gather together to give you worship and praise and thanks and glory for this precious gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Father, so often in this world, churches like to preach about what we need to do and how we need to act and behave and all this other stuff. And they oftentimes, dear Lord, fail to express and emphasize the fact that Jesus is the Savior from sin, that Jesus came to atone for us. Jesus died on the cross and rose again that we might know eternal life and salvation is ours. They fail to emphasize that Jesus did it all, and instead they seem to emphasize what we can do through Jesus. Well, dear Heavenly Father and Jesus, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit all the more into this world, that this world might hear and believe this wonderful and simple message of Jesus, that all has been taken care of because of what Jesus has done for us, how Jesus lived perfectly and died the per as the perfect and atoning sacrifice for our sins, how Jesus was raised from the dead, and that resurrection is the very thing that shows us that all that is found in Scripture from beginning to end is true and trustworthy. Continue to be our guide and help. Continue to give us faithful shepherds who proclaim your word, who proclaim that central message of Jesus Christ as the Savior from sin. We especially ask, dear Lord, that you continue to be with all those we know and love and all those who are in this world. We ask, dear Lord, that you would be their guide, their help, and their strength. Use difficulties, trials, and tribulations to bring people to turn their attention to you and to begin contemplating your love, grace, and mercy. And help people understand the, the ways of this world and the ways things are and why and that the answer is always found in Jesus. Continue to be our guide, our strength, our wisdom, our hope in all things. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, he who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may these words come true in your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.